Okay, so to begin the interview, could you please state your name? Uh, John Dutrasac. And your age, please? Uh, 75. And uh, where were you born? In uh, Dunville, Ontario, near the Niagara Falls. Okay. And uh, I guess at the time my father was uh, a millwright working in the woolen cotton industry, which was based in southern Ontario. Uh, it was the war and there was a lot of interest in blankets and sheets for uniforms and things of that type. So I guess about 1942, the family moved to uh, uh, to Toronto, where they worked in the uh, in the trade, uh, woolen and uh, cotton trade, and that's where uh, I basically grew up in Toronto. I remember almost nothing about uh, my life in Dunville. I was one or two, I guess, two years of age when I left. Okay, and uh, so growing up in the city, what were your kind of hobbies or interests? I thought about that in the question, and I, I really couldn't think of much. I remember uh, as a public school uh, playing sports. I was interested in that. Uh, near the end, I started to uh, collect minerals. There were some interesting uh, flow limestone deposits just beside our school in the uh, Don Valley Ravine. So I started collecting uh, limestone imprints of leaves and twigs and whatnot, and then went out in the country and looked for uh, calcite crystals and celestine crystals in adjacent uh, areas to see uh, what I could find. So I guess I've been collecting minerals since that time. Okay. So that was sort of a edging into the uh, the minerals in industry from a very small way. Back before the uh, Don Valley Parkway was developed. <laughs> Don Valley parking, way, parking lot has obscured a lot of sites there. Yeah. And uh, I guess I played sports. Uh, I remember we always played sports and uh, there were, uh, the ravines were places where a lot of the uh, boys went and uh, collected uh, natural artifacts, uh, dead birds, and all sorts of interesting things. So, it's sort of a natural history uh, background as well. Okay. And um, at school, what, um, what were your strengths or, again, interests academically? Well. Uh, <clears throat> in high school, I guess uh, my interests were in science and history, two two strange, uh, <laughs> dissimilar areas. And uh, uh, for a long time, I thought of a uh, going into history. Actually, I, I was interested in uh, a medieval history, and I took Latin for five years, uh, sort of in anticipation that that I might do that. Uh, I realized that the profession of history was limited and the career opportunities were, were very narrow, and, but they were, they were much better on the scientific field. So then I, I, I was good in maths and uh, chemistry and physics, natural history. Uh, we had in, at that time, the high school chemistry course was strongly biased towards metallurgy. It was the time when uh, the iron ore deposits in Quebec were being developed. Uh, Kitimat in BC was an exciting uh, aluminum breakthrough where they dammed mountain rivers and made their made aluminum. So there was a lot of interest in metallurgy at the time. In addition to the gold in uh, you know the gold deposits and, and around the country, so I became interested in metallurgy and thought that was a, a career for me. It's neat, it's neat to hear, uh, you don't hear it very often that um, as of high school they, they kind of talk and educate about uh, metallurgy. It was the chemistry of metal yeah. production. They had uh, the, electro, the, the uh, electrochemistry part was electro refining and electro winning of metals. There were items on smelting, on iron reduction. So it was just at the time, and I know all of that's disappeared because yeah. I've seen my daughter's and granddaughter's uh, chemistry curricula, and it's uh, they're, they're quite different now. Yeah, but at sure the can't time, say I had it either. No, that's right. So it was a perhaps a unique thing uh, after the war, where the metals industry in Canada was expanding, new smelters were being built, new refineries. Uh, Kid Creek had been discovered was discovered a little little after that, and. Uh, so it, it was a higher profile industry than, than it is now. Yeah. I'd say now it's computers and uh, electronics, high tech That's things true, seems yeah. to be the, the, uh, the thrust. That's right. Yeah. So, so I'm guessing um, you went to university 
in that uh, field? I enrolled in engineering, yes, and then moved into, the, into metallurgy, I guess, after the first year. In the second year, there was an a introduction to the area of engineering that you were interested in, and uh, so I had a metallurgical interest. And uh, uh, again, I found it intriguing, the chemistry uh, complex and interesting, and uh, it still is. It's, uh, so uh, I'm involved now in rare earths to some extent. And if there ever was a, an interesting and largely unknown chemistry, it's rare earth chemistry. There are many aspects that haven't been uh, uh, extensively researched. So that's where I, I moved into metallurgical engineering at uh, Toronto. Okay. Uh, Professor Pigeon was the department head at the time. Uh, I guess others have told you he's a, a bit of a character. He was always uh, exciting and uh, interesting to hear. So uh, that's where I ended up for my undergraduate career. Okay. Um, after that, what would you consider um, having been your first job or job well, I, I went to career? Okay, well, I went to graduate school and got a doctoral degree. Okay, right after? Right after okay. a master's degree and then a doctoral degree with uh, Professor Flangus in Molten Salt Chemistry. And uh, about that time, uh, Jim Tuguri moved from Naranda to the University of Toronto. And we got talking and he, uh, he arranged for me to apply for a job at Naranda Research Center in Montreal. I went down and was accepted. And at the time, Naranda Research had a, a research component. It had uh, NRC funding to look into uh, selenium chemistry and other areas. So I worked on that, and I guess I'd been there about eight or nine months when uh, uh, they decided not to renew their NRC funding, and a lot of the si scientific side of people uh, departed for other jobs, and I, I was one of them. So I went to work for the, was offered a job at the Mines Branch in Ottawa, which is now uh, CanMet uh, Mining, and uh, that's where I spent uh, 45, 45 okay. years. Uh, working at Naranda, did you ever work with uh, Peter Tarasov? Peter Tarasov was the um, man, I guess, in charge of the uh, developing the Naranda reactor mm -hmm. uh, at the time. And uh, Peter is a mineral collector as well. I don't know whether you know that, but he has yes, a, yes. an excellent, uh, particularly small micro mount collection of very, very fine minerals from uh, alkaline complexes. So. Uh, I knew Peter then, and since I went to the Mines Branch, I see Peter at mineral shows occasionally. Okay. <laughs> so we, he has relatives who live in Springfield, Massachusetts, and uh, the Springfield Mineral Show is one of the big East Coast uh, mineral shows in, in August, so I see okay. him there occasionally. Yeah, he was credited, there was a mineral named after him, I think, Peter. Peter yeah. which is found in, uh, I think, in St. Hilaire, actually. Yes. And Peter sent me uh, two specimens from, okay. from the type uh, type boulder or whatever it was. So I know Peter quite, I knew him well. I haven't seen him for a couple of years, but I know he's still the honorary mineralogy coordinator or curator at the uh, Red, Red Path, Path yes. Museum in, in Montreal. Yes. Yeah. When I had interviewed them, yeah. interviewed him, he mentioned uh, the Red Path Museum yes. quite a bit. And yeah. he, he's, I understand, has done an excellent job in uh, clarifying the nomenclature and sorting minerals out and putting things in order, which was something that Peter always did very well, very orderly uh, okay. person. So, so then uh, working at uh, CanMet, could you just explain, um, maybe <coughs> kind of briefly go through your career there and, and maybe I'll, I'll stop you as we go. Okay. Well, as I said, my doctoral degree was on molten salt chemistry of zirconium and hafnium. I went to work at Naranda on chemistry of selenium, particularly the high temperature chemistry of selenium and the selenides. And I was asked to go to the mines branch and I thought I would work on pyrometallurgy, but they wanted a hydrometallurgist. So I became an instant hydrometallurgist uh, as I walked through the door there and uh, I worked uh, on leaching of sulfide minerals was the first uh, project that I was involved with. And that carried on for a number of years looking at uh, copper sulfides, lead sulfides, zinc, 
silver minerals, uh, many things to do with sulfide mineralogy. And that was really the initial thrust of my uh, uh, research at the Mines Branch. Okay. And um, so what kind of, uh, what, what would you say throughout your career, uh, whether done by you or, or having witnessed this, what would be the um, key hydrometallurgical developments uh, you'd seen happen in Canada throughout your career? Well, there are certainly a lot of them to do with uh, uranium processing. Uh, at the time, the mines branch was linked to El Dorado Nuclear and the Elliott Lake uranium deposits and, and the Beaver Lodge deposit of El Dorado. And a lot of the chemistry was done there. And people, there was an exchange of people. El Dorado would cut back on their staff and they'd move to the mines branch and then they'd go back to El Dorado and there, there was an exchange of technologies there dealing with, uh, with leaching, with uh, solution purification by ion exchange and solvent extraction. Uh, Gord Ritzy was one of the, I don't know if you interviewed Gord. Next Monday. Next Monday. He's, uh, he was involved in uh, a lot of the early uranium work there and uh, developed uh, uranium technologies. I guess he has patents in the area. And that sort of moved him into the area of uh, waste treatment, tailings management. I don't know quite what the link was, but that's what happened. And then he and uh, Alan Ashbrook wrote uh, two books on uh, processing, and uh, I think Gord actually did most of the of the writing there. So Gord would, would explain more more about that for you. But that was certainly one. There was the development of the early uranium work. Um, another area, I, I guess, uh, of interest was pressure hydrometallurgy that came out in. Uh, there was a legal dispute as to who had developed pressure leaching for nickel ores, whether it was Frank Forward, uh, UBC, or Ken Downs at, at CanMet. And I, the Frank Forward won the, the case, with Sherritt, won the uh, case, in part because the government backs out of ever, every, every time there's a dispute with the private sector, they, they backed out. But certainly CanMet was involved in pressure hydrometallurgy very early. And I think Sherritt uh, did an awful lot of work to develop that technology into commercial realities for, for nickel, uranium, uh, they have a copper process, uh, uh, and that was certainly one of the developments in, in Canada has been this, this creation of a, a pressure hydrometallurgy expertise okay. with Sherritt and with other companies as well. And that led them into the uh, first zinc pressure leach process at Trail, uh, with, with what at the time was Cominco. And they then expanded into Hudson Bay and into Kidd, and then other overseas places as well. I think many of the overseas places have closed, but it's still actively involved in, uh, actively used in Canada. Okay. Just one moment. So. Okay, so could you. Um could you um, explain the pressure leaching kind of in layman's terms? Okay, what, uh, what had happened in, say, the zinc industry before was that the zinc occurs as a zinc sulfide mineral, and it was basically burnt in air to form zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. And there have been times when the sulfur dioxide, if it's made into acid, there were problems selling the acid. The, price was very low and it didn't cover shipping costs at times. So the idea was that if you could leach that using air or oxygen pressure at say 100 degrees or 150 degrees, then you would make elemental sulfur. And the advantage of the elemental sulfur is it could be recovered or it could be stored or it could be dumped into the tailings pond with the other sulfides. So it provided a means of separating zinc production from acid production, if, if you wanted okay. to do that. And uh, at times that's been a very attractive option, and at other times when the price of acid is high, it's not an attractive option. But I think that was the underlying thrust of it. There had been a great deal of work trying to do it at, uh, say, 100 or 110 degrees under a pressure, high air pressure or high oxygen pressure. And the problem was that you would not get complete extractions of the zinc, that the elemental sulfur that formed would coat the particles and inhibit the reaction. 
and I think it was actually the Japanese who first found that Cravacho and Lingdon sulfonate uh, dispersed the sulfur and allowed the reaction to continue. And then Sherrod applied that to pressure leaching at about 150 degrees. They were able to achieve 99% zinc recoveries. The elemental sulfur was separated. Um, it, it tech trail operations, they recover the sulfur. At Hudson Bay, I think it just goes into the tailings pond. And, it, and at uh, Kid Creek, when they operated, it was just dumped into the tailings pond where it gradually oxidized along with the, the other sulfides that were there. Okay. But uh, that's the essence of it. And uh, uh, one time, Sherrod very actively promoted the sale of that, but I think that's perhaps lesser so now than, than in the past. Okay. Now, uh, throughout your career, and this is often the most, uh, the, the question people find the most difficult, um, but has there been um, a certain project or um, part of your career that you would deem as dysfunctional? Something that, that sticks out as having been a very dysfunctional or... Well, people who work for the government project. say the entire organization <laughs> is dysfunctional at times, but uh, not, not really. There have been, uh, there have been times when uh, Things seem to be going off in all directions simultaneously. They haven't been uh, well coordinated. As a researcher, what I've always done is I've always sort of mapped out my my research avenue, and regardless of what the, how the others are changing their minds, I've more or less continued along the path that I set for myself initially. So I haven't really seen uh, a dysfunctional. <laughs> Uh, group um, certainly there, there. I guess in some companies the management uh, interferes to an extens extensive extensive ex extent, and things don't work. But that's not been not been my experience at Canmath. The has there been a lot of projects uh, times where you work on something, and um, the plans change, or it's kind of what y your research has to be, I guess, discarded, and you have to move on to something else. That has happened a number of times. Uh, one of the projects I had when I first started at CanMet was to measure the reaction of metals in sulfur vapor and selenium vapor from my interest in pyrometallurgy. And it involved uh, sealing a, a metal coupon on a silica glass spring, and the weight change would be measured by the extension of the spring. And you had to heat everything so that the the sulfur or the, or the selenium was at the coldest part of the system and that generated the vapor pressure. So that, then that work went on uh, quite well for about five or six years. And then the management decided that wasn't going any place and thought I should uh, discontinue it, so I did. I finished off the study that I was currently doing and haven't, didn't go back to it. Uh, um, it, it was of interest for uh, high, high, uh, high temperature gas turbines, jet engines, where they have sulfidation from uh, sulfur in the fuels that they were uh, working with. I gather that problem has been resolved to some extent, but uh, that was when they, they stopped. Uh, we had other projects on uh, thiosalts where we had an industry, a uh, government university team working on it. We thought we had solved the problem, and then the industry said uh, it was no longer a concern, so it, it stopped. Uh, that's happened from time to time, yeah. and uh, uh, we accept that. At CanMet, we've always been allowed sort of to finish off what was ongoing. You know, it takes six months to finish it off, so it allowed us to wrap things up uh, more or less completely. But yeah. that happens. And I know it happens in industry much more abruptly, where somebody just says, uh, you know, this isn't economical, stop it today, and they, and they do, you know. And uh, uh, often, without good justifications, in my experience, they, they tend to base a lot on maybe one or two pilot, you know, simple tests, when maybe if they'd done further test work, they would have been able to make it work. But uh, uh, that was the, their management's decision, and they, have to, they had to abide by, by it. So. Okay. And um, what has been some of your more, most significant work at Canada? What would, what, looking back, what would you say has been your favorite or most important okay. work? I think the 
the leaching of the sulfide minerals was certainly the initial work, and it carried on maybe for on and off for 25 or 30 years. Uh, it resulted in some early review articles in South in the South African review journals and Canadian American review journals, uh, outlining the, the work that had been done on sulfide leaching, looking at the processes. Um, that I thought was one we. We think we found an interesting observation in that when you discuss sulfide leaching in theory, everyone says the sulfur forms a uniform layer on the sulfide mineral. And as soon as we started to look at it microscopically, you see that's not the case at all, that the sulfur forms in discrete sites. It certainly changes your way of looking at the mechanism. Uh, we started to see well-formed, faceted sulfur crystals when we were leaching. And that convinced us that the sulfur was dissolving as hydrogen sulfide gas and then was being oxidized at certain sites to form either globules or, in some cases, uh, sulfur crystals. So that work, we worked on it for a long time and then got out of that field, but others carry on. Uh, sulfide leaching is still uh, the holy grail of metallurgy. If you can do it at 100 degrees, you know, you, you avoid smelting altogether. There, mm. People see uh, some advantages to it, but the smelting industry has changed as well, and it's made many improvements over the years, so smelting still remains the, uh, the most attractive way to do it if you can get rid of the acid. I think that's okay. the, the key step. Is that related to your uh, leach recycling work? When you when you talk about uh, sulfide leaching, no, I don't, I don't. I remember that leach recycling. I don't no. know exactly what you meant by leach recycling. We worked on um, one of the later projects uh, I worked on was on uh, uh, recycling. We were involved with the uh, recycling society here and the uh, European Union recycling groups. Um, we never did a lot of work on okay. recycling. We, character, we had characterization work on some recycled products, but my involvement there was more uh, organizational, organizing conferences, bringing people together from the European Union, from Vietnam, uh, Japan, talking about recycling. Okay. We gave a few papers on the Canadian recycling industry at overseas conferences, but we were never a major, I was never a major okay. force in, in recycling. Okay. Now you had mentioned uh, rare earth though and how lately you've been doing uh, more work on rare earth. Was that with CanMet? Uh, <laughs> I retired about four or five years ago. I was an emeritus scientist for three years. And at the time, I, rare earths were just starting to be studied at CanMed, and I offered to stay on as an emeritus scientist under certain conditions. The CanMet would not meet those conditions at the time. At the conference in Toronto, and just thereafter, I was approached to see whether I would come back as a part-time worker to initiate some studies on rare earths. So in uh, November of last year, I rejoined CanMed as a part-time okay. worker and have started to do some work on uh, rare earths, looking at, uh, I guess, deportment of rare earths during the precipitation of impurities and, ox and looking at, to a lesser extent, on oxalate precipitation. Uh, but I'm, I'm just starting on, on rare yeah, earths, okay. just starting on rare it's, earths. It's pretty interesting from what I hear that um, I had just interviewed uh, Janice Zink, yes. I'm guessing you know. Who was, who was also just starting to work on uh, rare earth for CanMet. CanMet received, I think, $25 million thereabouts over five years to encourage research on rare earths. And part of it, is, or a good part of it, is being done via contracts to people outside to look at literature reviews and uh, certain technologies, things that CanMet would have done itself 20 years ago, but now it's had so many reductions in staff and resources, it, it has to contract them out. But CanMet itself uh, is undertaking research in mineralogy, flotation, uh, leaching, precipitation, and impurity deportment, and finally the environmental 
uh, control of uh, largely thorium, I guess, in the in the residues. But all of that started about a year ago. Okay. Uh, and I think this April will be one year into the five-year contract. And as I think I mentioned earlier, rare earth chemistry is complex. Uh, there are many things that are not known about it. Uh, until recently, rare earths were not a priority element. Uh, they've suddenly become so, and people are starting to work on them. But you don't have that... Uh, you know, 100 year backlog that you have with sulfide leaching, where people have been looking at it on and off mm -hmm. for, for the last century or so. Yeah, but it is a, yeah, it's getting um, a lot of attention and it's becoming quite useful, especially for like renewable technologies. And it's, uh, like it's, they showed in, we had a short course in Ottawa and they showed the price of the, of the rare earths and they were relatively flat and then the Chinese announced restrictions, the price went up like that and then the Chinese dropped their restrictions and the price is back down more or less where it would have been. So I think a lot of the, there was a lot of interest at the time. Um, much of that interest has, has disappeared and the price of course has fallen dramatically for the rare earths, most of them. So I don't know what the future will be on that, whether there's really a, a place for a Canadian rare earth industry or not. They, I guess time will tell. Yeah, because apparently there is potential. Well, we there are many rare earths that they tell you are not rare. They're all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly Canada has a number. I think uh, any place that has a large, uh, you know, Precambrian granite base type things will have all sorts of rare earth deposits. The Russians must have them, uh, the Australians do. So they're certainly not rare. And it's a question of who can develop them most cheaply and get into the market first and establish control of the market. The mm -hmm. Chinese have 90 some percent of the market now and uh, uh, they'll be very difficult to displace. Yeah. Uh, now, if we move on a bit more to. Um I guess a few social questions. Um, you're known for, for having continuously promoted cooperation uh, between uh, the industrial and academic communities. Uh, so what initiatives were taken to accomplish this? What, uh, what work have you done in that uh, regard? Okay. Well, I've, over the years, I've put together a number of uh, industrial working groups. Um, I've had industrial groups in copper refining, copper electrofining, zinc processing, uh, smelting, and thiosalts. And these have been initiated through CANMEC uh, back in the time when CANMEC supported that type of work. Uh, we went out and they all started as a Canadian group. Uh, I know the copper refining group, we had the three Canadian copper refiners. Uh, I approached the people and asked them if they would be willing to get together and discuss their problems informally. Uh, they were willing to do so. One or two were reluctant. Uh, we brought in a couple of academic people from time to time to make presentations to the industrial people. And CANMET itself where it was working in the area would give talks as well. Those meetings were, um, uh, people were reluctant at first, they were afraid they were going to give away trade secrets, but it turns out that the industry has a number of common problems that are not proprietary, you know, things like keeping pumps pumping and uh, filtration and all sorts of things that uh, one company solves part of the problem and another company solves another part. And it turned out that once they got together and started presenting what they were doing on a theme topic for that meeting, it, it proved to be quite attractive. And then we started to hear from companies in the United States who were interested in joining, and they did. And then we heard from companies in South America who wanted to join. So it became a, a, a good means of distributing information. There, was no, there were no lawyers in the room. People just talked informally. Uh, and then they'd have, you know, have a lunch and a dinner and they could get together with somebody and go into great depth about, uh, you know, what, what alloy resisted the, that solution, you know, for the, was the best, what do you use, we use this. And so that worked quite well for copper, uh, equally well for zinc processing. At the time, Canada had, uh, I guess, four zinc plants, it now has three. But certainly, what with the um, uh, development of pressure leaching here, 
and the size of the Canadian operations. It provided a good foundation, and then it moved into the States. Uh, and then, of course, the American industry all but disappeared. The American zinc industry all but disappeared. So, uh, but, but that was the sort of thing that happened. Uh, smelting was more, a little more difficult because each smelting industry has different interests and different focuses. So that uh, what was of concern to the copper industry wasn't always con of concern to, to the lead industry or the nickel industry. But it, it lasted, that lasted for oh, maybe 10 years before CanMet, uh, uh, for financial reasons, said something had to be cut. So that was the one okay. I cut. And there was work as well. That wasn't just um, industry. That wasn't just companies. There was also um, schools involved. Right? We, um, the, certainly the Thiosalt project involved a number of academic people okay. who were looking at uh, things like oxygen solubility, novel oxidants, uh, items of that type. Uh, we always invited some uh, suppliers occasionally to the copper and zinc movie uh, meetings. Uh, there were some academics, Dave Dreisinger, who I suppose is on your list, he, he attended a number of the meetings. Uh, Tom O'Keefe from the States, who died a few years ago, but uh, he attended many of our meetings. Uh, uh, so we had, we had an academic representation. Mm -hmm. We tried to avoid involving uh, graduate students and their research. We were looking for the professor who sort of could give an overview of what uh, was going on in his labs and related to what was going on in the industry. So that, that seemed to work moderately well, yes. Okay. Um, there's another question I, I always ask uh, throughout the interviews, and that's the question of um, the presence of women. Um, and throughout your career, you, you've worked <coughs> mostly worked in at CanMet, but uh, throughout your career, have you seen an increase in women? What was the presence um, when you started, when you retired? Um, I remember in undergraduate career in engineering. Uh, I think in chemistry they had maybe two or three hundred students. I think there were two women in the in the class. Mm -hmm. So they were very rare in engineering, much more common in, the, in chemistry and, and uh, more chemistry than physics. When you got into biochemistry, there was a greater percentage of female uh, students. That changed when I went to uh, Miranda Research. There were a number of uh, women uh, technologists or sci scientists or technologists uh, I don't think any of them were in managerial positions, but there were certainly a number in the chemical laboratory, uh, doing work in the labs and in the pilot plant. CanMet, um, I guess there would be a, some at the time I joined. There are now a, a great many, <laughs> a great many, and in part because there have been government uh, uh, they call them tar targets or objectives, but they're, they've turned out to be almost quotas. I think people feel you have to hire so many uh, whatever groups being promoted. So there are now a, a large number of uh, female uh, scientists, managers, Janice Sink mm -hmm. being one, uh, uh, technicians, certainly a large number of uh, female technicians. So th th they've been a growing, growing number. When you go to a conference now, it's quite common. I'd say maybe a third of the room is female students and engineers, uh, whatever. So yeah, yeah. definitely more uh, today. Uh, more women in uh, in school than there were back in the day. They, they sure. people. <laughs> I think one Nobel Prize laureate got in trouble for saying that when you hire a woman scientist, the first thing you know, she's married, has children, and has to leave. So, uh, and there's an element of truth in that, that uh, uh, the burden of family life falls mostly on the, on, on, mm -hmm. on the mother, I think. So uh, she's not able to spend the amount of time that perhaps a male could on the topic. But that obviously varies according yeah. to the individual. Uh, True. And it is changing, um, whereas the man is, is taking more and more of these responsibilities. But yeah, it is still, I wrote an article uh, not that long ago, and uh, it's still statistically true that um, it's women that quit their jobs halfway through their careers, in the middle of their careers, yeah. much more than men. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the main reason why. Um, another question is, do you think there's a, 
large disconnect uh, or not between um, the natural resource industry and the general public? And if so, why? Okay, as I mentioned, when I got into the business 45 year, years ago, that the resource industry was seen as a high profile, very positive, it was making jobs, export earnings, all the positive things were being emphasized. I think since then, there's been more emphasis on the negative aspects, the pollution, the tailings dam failures, uh, effluent waste leaching into the water, the fact that they've become tremendously capital intensive and yet much of the capital is spent outside the country for equipment and parts and whatnot. Uh, that problem is worse for third world countries where I think they're starting to realize that the uh, billion dollar project involves 900 million spent outside the country you know, to, to buy, buy things. But certainly the public's perception of the industry has changed. Um, I think the pollution problems that it has, uh, you know, the, the spills, they're, they're well publicized now. Maybe in the past they were just uh, of local interest. Now they make uh, the headlines across the country. So that's changed. Uh, the industry treats its people uh, from the public point of view badly. They're massive, 12,000 people laid off, you know, or this sort of thing, large layoffs. Uh, um, you know, that, that sort of thing changes the perception of the, uh, of the industry. And do you think as well, um, the on the industry side, do you think they, don't nec they also have a disconnect with the general public? Uh, to some extent, the industry has become very focused on making money. And uh, I used to think that the copper industry was interested in making copper. I now realize that was naive. They're interested in making money and lots of it. And uh, there is this growing perception that uh, greed is the dominating factor. You know, people start to hear about the bonuses that people are making and, uh, you know, the profits they make and then they have to lay off, uh, you know, cut 500 jobs or something and they, they don't really make that, uh, that connection. Uh, the companies realize now they need social license to, to continue. So they go through the emotions of what they have to do but I think there are people who will say, do they really believe in communicating with those involved? Or is it just a formal exercise? You, you hold three meetings with the Aboriginal people and you go ahead and do what you're going to do anyway. You know, the, so there, there, is, uh, there is that uh, conflict between the, the public and, and the industry. The other part is that for much of the country, the industry is a very minor uh, component of the, of the gross domestic product. Locally, it's very important. Uh, in a mining town, it's very important. But across the nation, it's of much lesser importance than it was 50 years ago, I, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, it's a mouthful, um, but it's, it's, um, there's no wrong answer. It's really in your opinion. So here I go. In your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, anything really that you deem must be mentioned when discussing the history of the natural resources in Canada, and specifically more of the mining, metallurgy, petroleum side of it? Well, I mentioned the work that Sherrod has done on promoting pressure hydrometallurgy. That, that would be one. The other one, although it's not in my area, is the uh, flash smelting uh, technique and, and bath, bath smelting technique that was developed by uh, Inco initially. Well, I guess Walter Kerlock and uh, um, people like that were involved in developing that. And then the Naranda flat, continuous uh, smelting process was another one. Those, I think, were uh, at the leading edge of technology at the time. They were using a tonnage oxygen to conserve uh, energy, to conserve fuel. Uh, the Inco process and, and the Utacumpu process sort of developed in parallel. Uh, for some reason, the Utacumpu process has been marketed much more widely than the Inco process. Uh, uh, but uh, I think Inco was one of the innovators there in the, uh, must have been the late 40s, early 50s. 
The Naranda technique was really developed in the early 60s, I guess. Uh, it has been picked up by the Chileans with the, uh, you know, with their own uh, smelting technology, the Teniente uh, converter. But uh, the use of plumage oxygen and smelting would have been one. Uh, are there any others? There, mu there must be. <laughs> there must be. I, one, uh, the, the aluminum industry, uh, I know they made innovations into bipolar cells, very energy efficient cells. They have not been implemented and they're still using the, the old uh, Hall Heru cell. Uh, and I think Pechine has pioneered the has been the, the leader in that area from France. Uh, magnesium at one time, Canada had the pigeon magnesium process, which was innovative. Uh, I spent a summer working in a pigeon plant just up the Ottawa Valley here, and they were quite proud of the fact that they'd sold a plant to China. And that turned out to be, of course, the downfall of the North American industry because the Chinese took the technology expanded it, used it wisely uh, with their low labor costs, and dominate the magnesium market today. But that was something that was developed in, in Canada and uh, I guess just after the war, uh, just mm. after the war. You had mentioned the, the, I guess, the business exported to China. Um, a recurring answer I get with this question is the disappearance of the Canadian companies, the Canadian names. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think of that? And working for CanMet, um, did that affect you, uh, you guys there? It's ironic that all of those takeovers have all been passed through our department to see if there was a net benefit to the country. The, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this now that I'm a part-time employee, but there, was, there were a number of the technical people who said there were no advantages to Canada from those takeovers. However, at the higher level, the takeovers were approved. And I, I think it's a tragedy because your profits, as in everything, the country is being sold off uh, piecemeal in, in uh, uh, manufacturing and metals and retail, uh, restaurants, everything, they're all uh, foreign chains. The disadvantage is that the profit leaves the country and then somebody outside the country decides where and how to invest that. I think back to the cobalt silver camp where people, some people made a great deal of money. That money was reinvested in Canada, in part developing the Timmins gold areas. Uh, that doesn't happen when U.S. Steel owns the uh, old Stelco works. If they make money, it goes to Pittsburgh and they decide what they will spend it on and whether they'll invest in China or somewhere else. You know, that, that's one problem with that. You also have decisions about uh, closing things made overseas. I know when Extrata took over, they promised there would be no job cuts for three years. And I think shortly after three years, Naranda Technology Center was merged with Falcon Bridge Technology Center. So you, there are many negative aspects to that and perhaps not many positive ones. Okay. Um, that's, that's, um, that's what I hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's recurring through these interviews. And it's almost all gone. Uh, tech is an exception. Mm -hmm. Tech still processes here. Share it, which is partly foreign owned. I think half, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's partially foreign owned. But it imports Cuban material and makes metals here in Canada. So it's, uh, it's at least uh, half a Canadian company doing quite well. Uh, the big gold producer, Barrick, mines much of its gold outside the country. It's yes. in Toronto, I guess, for tax tax reasons. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, well, it was. Uh, that's where it was established. Yeah. In Toronto. So, yeah. So it hasn't moved yes. um, with uh, Peter Monk yeah. a while back. So, uh, But yeah, no, other than that, you look at, you know, Stelco, um, Inco. Fasco, Stelco, Fasco. Algoma Steel, yeah. Inco, Falcon Bridge, Alcan. Mm -hmm. Sold to Rio Tinto, uh, yeah. Quebec Iron and Titanium sold to uh, Rio Tinto. Uh, so. Do you think it'll? Do you think eventually it would change? Mm -hmm. it, it matches the industry that's very cyclical, or no? No, I don't think that's going to change. Uh, and the reason being that the the uh, governments seem 
willing to allow the country to be sold off piecemeal. Uh, you've just, I've just seen the big Canadian, the one remaining big Canadian hardware company, Rona, has been stole, sold to Lowe's. So the hardware industry in Canada is now dominated by American companies, which buy American tools and American supplies. Uh, so it's a, uh, I, I don't see it changing unless there's a, uh, a political will to, to stop okay. doing that. But you have the prime minister and others running around looking for in foreign investment, <laughs> you know, somebody to come in and buy something. The low value of the dollar makes it cheap for them to buy and our banks will lend them the money at low rate to buy it. So uh, I don't see it changing in the near future. Okay. Um, just a few closing questions. Um, this question more, um, well, we can divide it in two. What are you proudest of in life? And we could say in life, but we could also say professionally in your professional career. Well, Bernie Sanders said he was his greatest achievement was he'd been married for 27 years and had two, two or three children. I've been married for 47 years and have two children as well. So uh, I guess that certainly has been uh, something that's uh, unusual these days. When you're at a table, everyone's talking about their second wife, their third <laughs> wife, their fourth wife. <laughs> I wonder where I've gone wrong at times, you know. But uh, anyway, that's certainly something that's. Uh, been beneficial to me. It's provided a stable base, uh, which al has allowed me to work. Uh, you know, I can work till six o'clock and go home, and dinner is ready. And uh, my wife hasn't doesn't complain if I have to read something after dinner. So that's been one successful thing, I guess. The other is, I th I suppose, scientifically, I think it would be the work done on uh, applied mineralogy, which was something that started. In, in Mines Branch at the time, where people started to use looking at uh, residues and concentrates to try to explain what is happening in the process. And with people like uh, Dr. Chen, who was my colleague for a number of years, Louis Cabri, uh, we uh, collectively used that technique to look at uh, metallurgical reactions to see what is going on. I mentioned the business of, the, of sulfur not coating, not forming a uniform coating, and there are all sorts of cases where you look at it and what you think, what the company thinks is happening, what you initially think is happening, isn't. It's something quite different when you actually look at it with high, high resolution uh, magnification. So that's been a, sort of a minor, minor success. Um, what else would I? Some of the work we did on zinc processing with applied mineralogy, iron precipitation, which is an area I worked on for a number of years and I'm still doing with uh, rare earths. We're looking at rare earth deportment in iron precipitates. That's been uh, a fact a feature for me. Over the years, I've met a lot of people who have been very, very helpful, uh, who've been a pleasure to work with who've tried to cooperate, I've cooperated with them and they with me, and we've tried to get things things done. Many of those sort of worked into uh, at least a business-type friendship where you go out with people and travel with them occasionally, and that was certainly enjoyable. Not all of the people you meet fall into that category. There are some you'd rather forget about, but I think that's true anywhere. Any, I was just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, that, those, are, you know, those are the sort of things that uh, I would look upon as uh, sort of attractive features to my career, attractive features. Last question, and it's one of my favorites, and it's um, if you were to uh, speak to someone much younger, like a student, for example, what would be the one uh, life lesson or piece of advice you would give them? Regarding their career, you could also look at it as a career in maybe the natural resources, but it could also just be but their future in general? I have students <laughs> working with me, <laughs> and they ha they've asked that question, what do you think I should do? And my comment is usually to provide a sound grounding, because what you learn in university or certainly in high school, by the time you're ready to apply it, it will be obsolete. So what is important is that you, you understand what is happening 
you learn certain techniques to look certain ways of looking at problems you know how you break them down into subdivisions address one after another sort of a logical approach to problems but I tell them that's the way they should do it the other thing I tell them to do is to uh, to write up what you do <laughs> because there's nothing even for the students we have they if you do a little little piece of research is fine but to do a little piece of research and write it up as an internal report or something gives you something that you can reference for your next position it shows within the organization where you're working what you that you've actually done something that you're able to explain it and write it up so if you decide to stay with that organization it's a step in the right direction if you decide to leave it's something that you can point to I did this and this is the report that described it. So that's one thing I urge them to do is, is to document what they've done. Helps you remember what you've done too. <laughs> if you start well, I, I, I can tell you, my age, that becomes increasingly important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Good advice. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, not really. Uh, uh, as I say, I, I, I'd like to see this sort of thing put into a form where it would be attractive to people but I don't really know how you're going to do that it, <laughs> you have you say you have a hundred sixty people or yeah we're uh, we're aiming for minimum 70 and we're at uh, in the 60s right now so if you take say 70 people even times five minutes it's six hours of viewing time and no one is going to take six hours to view that type of uh, documentation so I don't know whether you'd be better, you know, to take smaller component, take select certain people, because at a conference, say this Metsaw conference in in Quebec City, this is the sort of thing you could show on a television screen near registration, but it has to be catchy, you know. What mm -hmm. you, nobody's going to sit for six hours and of listen. Course. To the, so if you had maybe four or five people. With with two minutes. or three minutes each, uh, perhaps. And then just um, asking what you think here for a conference like that, would you prefer seeing a these few minutes of these few people talking about um, necessarily this, their scientific work, or would you also like to see their social, the question about their social answers or uh, their personal experiences, things like that? Well, what I would, guess what would you find interesting? Or what would you think <sighs> would be catchy in a... A conference like that I think depending on the individual it could be any of any okay. of those if you had someone who had an interesting experience and was a you know very talented speaker that type of thing would, would go over um, it's the sort of thing you could have say at the uh, hydrometallurgy has a luncheon mm -hmm. if you had for the historic and historical metallurgy has a luncheon it's the sort of thing where you could show that for maybe five minutes mm -hmm. you know get three people there yep. bang 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 that would be uh, that would hold people's attention and would be informative and you could also note that the you know the complete program is available wherever it's on our website yeah, yeah. or so, for or it's yeah, yeah yeah excellent so well, the scientific you. part I don't think you'd interest Science has become so fragmented and specialized, you know, that if you're talking about this, 99% of the people are going to be interested in something else. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that's and, and that's why the, the oral history aspect of it is neat because no matter what you've done in your career, you quite often can come out of this with um, an interesting anecdote or, yeah. you know. Historical, like we worked uh, on historical metallurgy f for a long time uh, with, with uh, Pathy Habashi. Mm -hmm. and I guess you've interviewed yes. Pathy? In Toronto, actually, in Toronto. At, the, okay. at the conference. So he's, uh, he, myself, Arthur Dunn, Sam Marcusen, there have been a number of people involved in historical metallurgy uh, trying to get the Canadian aspect. And Peter Tarasov was always keen that we should do Canadian developments, whereas Fathi tends to use European okay. developments. <laughs> so Peter was always very keen on that. Um, and that I found intriguing. Uh, it's a very short history, you know, compared to Chinese or European, even American uh, metallurgy. It's a very short history, but it has some interesting components in it. Uh, so that would Absolutely. be. 
that would be a place to show some of this. Uh, I suppose pictures wouldn't do anything, just stagnant pictures. You'd need a television screen with mm -hmm. somebody there. Yeah. Uh, at your museum, I, I, when it was open, <laughs> we used to go there with the children and grandchildren, yes. and I found that people would watch the television screen for about two minutes. Yeah, it's not, yeah, absolutely. No matter how interesting it is, absolutely. it's, it's, they're just in and out, you know, sort of thing, and yeah. uh, and it's getting it's getting shorter. more and more like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, and part of the trouble is there's so much like that now. Television has uh, all sorts of nature shows, science shows. Uh, uh, people are inundated with uh, that type of information. So uh, I, I see the time span, the fo focus span, is very short. It uh, is. It is. So that's why. I had mentioned going for the snippets, snippets. like that. Yeah, snippets. exactly. Yeah. Which I've done. I've, I've done a few compilations so far. Some of more of the motive parts of these interviews. Others with. Um, I did one also on the question of women. Um, different perspectives on that. So, so yeah, that's what I'm looking to do for the. Mm -hmm.